Prince Chubby Cheeks was an only child and heir to the throne of the tiny kingdom of Baluchi. From the moment he was born, the king and queen doted on him endlessly. He was an adorably fat baby that they loved to cuddle and feed sweet treats to. As a toddler, Prince Chubby Cheeks refused to walk anywhere himself. He would hold out his pudgy little arms until a servant carried him wherever he wanted to go. By age five, he became so round that he got stuck in palace doorways if they weren't wide enough. The king ordered all entryways expanded so his precious little prince would never have to squeeze his girth through rooms again. As Prince Chubby Cheeks grew older, his parents allowed him to rule their lives. His days revolved around stuffing himself with all the savoury meat pies, buttery pastries and thick creamy sauces that the royal chefs prepared. Immediately after waking up, the young prince would ring a golden bell that summoned the staff to roll him out of bed and dress him for breakfast. Chefs would present him with heaping platters of bacon, eggs, pancakes, waffles, sausages and towers of buttered toast. Next, the Queen would have the royal classroom set up and tutors would attempt to teach the Prince his lessons. But Prince Chubby Cheeks had zero interest in academics or politics. After scribbling just a few half-hearted words, he would whine, I'm tired, until attendants put away the school books and brought out his toys and desserts instead. By his 10th birthday, Prince Chubby Cheek's daily schedule consisted of eating five large feasts prepared just for him and playing with his solid gold toy soldiers and horse figurines in between. He refused to dress himself, bathe himself, or do anything besides eat, play and sleep. Servants carried him from his bedroom to the dining hall and back because walking short distances wore him out quickly. Stairs were impossible. The prince often got winded just talking for a few minutes at a time. Even chewing tired out his jaw. And Prince Chubby Cheek's parents felt delighted to pamper his every wish and whim. The queen loved caressing his flabby little hands and feet, while the king enjoyed watching the prince devour his weight in pastries with an amused chuckle. They never scolded him, made him study or encouraged exercise or proper manners. The prince grunted instead of speaking, often spit food as he chewed with his mouth wide open, and chose to wallow in his own filth for weeks on end rather than endure a bath. By age 12 he weighed over 300 pounds and the entire palace reeked horribly from his poor hygiene, but the king and queen just giggled affectionately and sniffed the top of his greasy, unwashed head. Isn't he the most adorable angel? they would sigh. As Prince Chubby Cheeks careened into his teenage years, the challenges of his unhealthy lifestyle compounded. Simply dressing himself in the morning caused him to break into a full sweat within minutes. He refused to wear anything remotely formal or tailored, just extra-wide nightshirts that stretched over his bulging stomach and ballooning hindquarters. Rolling into the dining hall and lifting a fork took all the energy he could muster some mornings. Even chewing seemed exhausting for the perpetually tired and cranky prince. Yet his doting parents continued indulging Prince Chubby Cheek's every whim. When he issued a shrill cry of, More! More! At the end of a massive meal, royal chefs would parade out cakes, pies, pastries and puddings until the prince sank into a food coma at the table. When he petulantly rang his bell and announced he wanted entertainment, dancers, jesters and musicians would perform elaborate shows that bored the cranky prince after just a few minutes, then get dismissed back to their quarters. If Prince Chubby Cheek spilled food on himself at dinner or soaked the bed in night sweats, he would throw horrific tantrums, punching walls and servants, until the king ordered laundry maids to change his linens and clothing no matter the unholy hour. By age 16, Prince Chubby Cheeks weighed nearly 500 pounds and was entirely dependent on teams of servants, attending to his every need all day and night. He rang his golden bell incessantly to demand food, waddle him place to place, wipe his greasy hands and mouth, scratch inside his itchy skin folds when something irritated him read him bedtime stories when he was bored, and cleaned the dozens of chamber pots lining his room so he wouldn't need to walk to the lavatory, which no longer fit his huge backside anyway. Too heavy to sit at his own dining table, Prince Chubby Cheeks ate all his meals, half reclining on plush pillows and padded benches dragged over just for him. He spilled as much food on himself as he managed to cram down his throat. At this point, the king and queen finally acknowledged that their son needed help, 
but instead of discipline or firm guidance, they chose to send for famed healers, medicine men, and comforts from across the land, hoping someone could magically make him thinner and happier. Acupuncturists poked at Prince Chubby Cheek with their needles until he cried, enough was enough. Ayurvedic practitioners rubbed smelly oils on his folds, but abandoned their efforts when he violently scratched at anything that itched. Nutritionists tried putting the prince on diets, only to get barred from the castle when Prince Chubby Cheeks shrieked for pastries and steak. Therapists attempted talking to the prince, but were useless against his constant demands for stuffed goose and wine topping off his goblet. In the end, none could curb his appetites or make even a dent in his girth. The discouraged king and queen dismissed the teams of healers after just a month. We just need to love him as he is, the king proclaimed wearily, returning to pretending not to notice his son's disturbing conditions. On his 18th birthday, Prince Chubby Cheeks woke up furious to find no hefty breakfast feast already waiting for him. He rang his golden bell over and over until servants came running anxiously. It's the prince's birthday, one whispered excitedly. But instead of delightedly indulging him with a bone-cracking birthday buffet, they merely carried Prince Chubby Cheeks to be bathed, dressed and escorted to the throne room, which confused and aggravated him. There, his father the king reached out to touch Prince Chubby Cheeks' hand affectionately. It was the first physical contact they had in years. My son, now that you are of age, it is time for you to begin your search for a bride, the king announced. You shall have the loveliest maiden in the land for your future queen. The queen clasped her hands delightedly as servants murmured excitedly at the prospect of an upcoming royal wedding. But Prince Chubby Cheeks only frowned deeper. Bride? No! Food! He demanded in his deep, wheezing voice. Wedding talk meant nothing to him against the thought of missing breakfast. Yet for months afterwards, the efforts in the palace turned towards finding Prince Chubby Cheeks a wife. Even when visiting princesses from neighboring kingdoms arrived to be presented to him, the cranky prince usually bellowed food. Within the first five minutes, more interested in the elaborate feasts prepared to impress visiting dignitaries than meeting any marriage candidates. Time and again, offended princesses would storm out when Prince Chubby Cheeks rudely turned his attention mid-conversation towards stuffing crab legs and pork chops into his mouth with his hands. You must pick a bride eventually, dear boy. The king kept insisting in exasperation as four years passed by swiftly. But Prince Chubby Cheeks remained indifferent, occupying himself only with pestering servants and gorging on rich dishes from morning till night. He rarely left his private rooms anymore except to travel to distant summer palaces for health visits, which really meant being transported somewhere cooler and cleaner for weeks at a time, so overburdened castle staff could air out and restore his putrid main quarters at the palace without him constantly in the way. By age 25, Prince Chubby Cheeks looked less human and more like an overgrown grubworm enrobed in sore pocked fat instead of pale skin, when servants managed to finally coax him into rare baths. He only wore giant tunics to hide most of his swollen figure. Simple tasks like sitting up or rolling over took great heaves of effort that often left him panting and whimpering from exertion. His matted hair hung in greasy curtains around his face. Since letting servants come near him with scissors risked accidentally nicking his bumpy skin and sending him into weeks-long tantrums. What teeth remained rotted away undisturbed inside his mouth. The prince's chamber smelled like the backside of a barn no matter how many fresh floral arrangements and incense braziers got tucked discreetly around the room. And still every morning the chambermaids awoke to find multiple soiled linens piled around Prince Chubby Cheek's gigantic bed from his nighttime accidents. Yet out of lifelong duty, weary servants continued waiting on his every handbell ring and infantile demand. By age 30, finding a wife for the prince turned from repeated uncomfortable failures to an utterly hopeless cause. What royal family would possibly send their daughter to marry such a creature? Even the most impoverished peasant women recoiled in horror the few disastrous instances Prince Chubby Cheeks got paraded out to village matchmaking fairs under brightly coloured canopies thrown up to shade him. All other activity would grind to a halt as crowds gaped at the lumbering, sweating prince, picking his teeth and nose between bellowing for more honey cakes from fearful servants. 
Strolling minstrels would awkwardly stop their instruments as women hid their children's faces and pulled them back from the stench rippling off Prince Chubby Cheek's flowing robes. Men doubled over to retch into the grass behind them. Eventually, guards would shuffle forward to usher the shocked villagers politely away so Prince Chubby Cheeks could be guided back to palace transports, having only managed 15 minutes outside before exhaustion set in. After one mortifying village scene, where a little girl screamed at the sight of Prince Chubby Cheeks while her mother fainted straight away, the Queen herself tearfully suggested cancelling any future public bride quests. Oh, my poor baby boy, she sniffed into a lace handkerchief. We shall have to find another way. The king stared broodingly into the distance as servants tried hiding their smirks of relief. Back at the castle, Prince Chubby Cheeks paid no mind to his disastrous betrothal attempts out in the real world. He busied himself as always with gorging all day, napping after meals, then ringing his little golden bell to signal servants to carry him to the next feast once he roused. Over time, he lost the ability to speak any actual words beyond food and no as his tongue seemed to thicken and enlarge along with the rest of him. Communication turned into just grunts, whimpers, shrieks and sighs, as servants learned to anticipate his every need from a mere eyebrow twitch. By age 40, Queen Cassia herself took over sitting with bloated Prince Chubby Cheeks for parts of his days. She hummed softly, while spooning broth, gravies and custards into his mouth when he tired of even chewing. As he grunted and shifted his weight restlessly, she delicately dabbed the mess trickling down his chins herself. My sweet darling boy, she would murmur, mother loves you so. At this point, servants privately hoped the prince might randomly pass away peacefully in his sleep one night to the blessed relief of all. But as ever, no matter how fat, foul, furious and feeble Prince Chubby Cheeks became, he continued existing much the same decade after decade, cared for, if not truly loved, by the small handful who knew no other life than tending to his wants and whims since infancy. They continued bathing him with rags on long poles, spoon-feeding him, changing his soiled sheets, and propping up his huge form between soft nests of pillows without complaint. It was duty ingrained into their bones generations before. On his 50th birthday, Prince Chubby Cheeks, now swollen to over 700 pounds, received a very special gift indeed. The elderly king, without consulting his ailing wife first, had sought supernatural help from rich foreign shamans passing through the kingdom on an herb-gathering quest. For a staggering sum of gold bars and jewels, they at last presented the king with a rare potion imbued with ancient magic to help the ruined prince. Guaranteed to reverse bad conditions and habits from forming in unfledged youth, the head shaman insisted in broken language. King Regwald studied the ornate vial of glowing rose serum. Distrustfully, before making his desperate decision, what other hope did the kingdom have with his son in no state to ever inherit the throne without some kind of miracle intervention at this point? Either the potion purified Prince Chubby Cheeks or the overtaxed king would soon need to reluctantly name a distantly related nephew as uncertain heir. Instead, should the ailing queen pass before him too? This magic brew was the prince's last chance to still set things right somehow. The king dearly hoped he hadn't just been robbed blind by fanciful well-wish potion sellers, turning his grief into temporary profit on their way out of the kingdom. But with no other options left, he shamefacedly handed the birthday serum over to the Queen and hoped for a blessing. At the stifling, lavish birthday feast prepared for nobles and envoys visiting to pay annual respects, servants carefully propped up the immense Prince Chubby Cheeks on a raised mound of velvet cushions between his parents' thrones. Lords and ladies bowed politely and averted their eyes from his dreadful, bloated countenance guardedly, peeking out between the ornate tent poles and mirrored screens set up to shade his bulk. Stifling in formal robes for the first time in years and exhausted from the effort of being heaved onto his viewing perch by ropes and pulleys that morning, the wheezing prince barely paid attention to the toasts and greetings offered in his honour. He merely squeezed his eyes shut against the offensive brightness until servants shuffled forward with the first groaning carts of food tributes collected for his table. With the room's ill focus, all on platters heaping with stuffed game hens, buttered hams and gold filigree bowls brimming with sauces and sweets, only Queen Cassia noticed when Prince Chubby Cheeks let out a sudden frightful groan, more chilling than his usual dull laments. She realised instantly 
that something horrid was about to unfold as his enormous form seemed to swell and ripple strangely under his finery. Regwald, the potion ill agrees with, she urgently tried warning in a choked whisper, meant only for her husband. But too late. Prince Chubby Cheek's gigantic body gave a sickening squelch sound and exploded without warning into viscous and bloody chunks, just as servers stepped forward to present him with an exquisite birthday tower of jewel-like candied fruits and sugared berries. For a few stunned heartbeats as realization hit panicking guests, the whole room froze in shock. Then came the shrieking. Court ladies fainted straight into scandalized Lord's arms behind them, while servants flailed amid the gruesome carnage now coating walls fine courtiers and bolting nobles alike, without discrimination. Panic at the profoundly dark sorcery that spontaneously struck down the prince reigned until the king's own anguished cries for order echoed off the vaulted ceilings. Prince Chubby Cheek's 50th birthday celebration became his gruesome final farewell instead. It still didn't properly sink in for King Regwald or his ailing Queen Cassia until three days later, when servants ferried small crates of the prince's remains away for crypt internment and discreet island burial. Neither parent could bear to glimpse what little ragged pieces were left of their only child, once his bulk imploded without warning or reason, mid-gathering as shocked assemblage watched. The unlucky few attending nurses able to stomach cleaning up the unholy aftermath swore whatever remaining flesh they shoveled into boxes dripped with toxins and stank of the deepest evil. Our precious boy, dark charms from those wandering impostors took you ill too soon. Queen Cassia still wept brokenly on her deathbed two months later as she clung desperately to her husband's strong arm. Both had rapidly aged beyond their years almost overnight from profound grief and stress, according to muttering castle staff. All our gold and jewels just to bury our child. The king himself now stooped and stumbling grimly through abbreviated days, haunted by his costly mistake. Prince Chubby Cheeks should have made some amends and peace during his 50th year. Instead, greedy mystical vagabonds fleece the desperate king of a fortune and murdered his only heir without even needing to draw a hidden dagger. No mortal medicine could have fixed decades of royal damage already wrecked on the undeserving prince from infancy. Regwald robbed himself of rescue funds for the failing kingdom and still grieved an empty legacy, his family line ending wretchedly no matter what. Heart torn with anguish, all he wished left was to speedily join his beloved wife and son in the tranquil abyss of the hereafter, away from such grave sins and errors weighing down his weary crown. Their family history now lay buried in sorrow with the prince's remains and signified the death knell of their dynasty with it.